Hey everyone, uh, my name is Anthony Loss and I am a lead solutions architect here uh, at ClearScale. Uh, ClearScale is a premier AWS partner and today um, we are gonna dive into data lakes. We're gonna talk about what data lakes are, uh, the importance of data lakes, how they work from a technical standpoint, and then finally, some of the use cases for data lakes uh, that ClearScale has implemented. So very interesting topic today, one of my favorites to talk about. and. Um, excited to get right into it. First, just a little bit about ClearScale before we get into the nitty gritty. Uh, ClearScale is, like I said, it's an AWS premier tier services partner. Um, we're an all in AWS firm. That means that all we do uh, all day, every day is AWS solutions. And uh, we're headquartered in San Francisco. We have offices uh, pretty much all over the United States and employees all over the world. Uh, and we've been in uh, business here with AWS specifically for uh, just over 10 years now and done over a thousand projects and uh, have over 500 customers. So um, one of the landmark partners in the AWS partner network for sure and um, a great partner to, to learn about. Um, regarding today's topic, it's there's a lot of buzzwords in in the topic of data lakes and the topic of big data in general. Uh, if you've been in the IT industry for uh, any longer than five minutes, you're going to um, hear the buzzword of big data and uh, potentially the buzzwords of data lakes like formations, uh, analytics, stuff like that. And we are in the age of it. Uh, we are in the age of understanding uh, what data can do from us, um, how it can empower our businesses and give us insights into what we're trying to do on the day-to-day -day basis, whether it's um, you know uh, things like healthcare um, or manufacturing or just basically any type of analytics that we can uh, we can potentially gather, and you'll find quickly, and as you haven't already, that it's it it, it really is not industry specific. Um, big data is everything that we do, and now that we have access to this data, it it kind of goes into well, how do we leverage it, right? And we have all this data at our fingertips. How do we leverage this data and have actionable insights or provide our customers or internal user, users actionable insights to, um, to manipulate and then uh, analyze the data at hand? And so that's how we kind of get into the term data lake. Um, and talking about what a data lake is, is, is it's a number of things, right? It's a, it's a very loaded term, data lake. But essentially what it is, is it's a central repository of all your data. Um, just as it sounds. And essentially what that means is that you can have multiple sources of data all going into one centralized location, empowering you to have all types of outputs and ana analytical um, tools at your fingertips. Now, having said that, data lakes aren't specific to AWS or any other cloud provider in general. Data Lake is a methodology. And so there's not gonna be one infrastructure or one tool set um, that gives you a data lake. It's a methodology. You can have a data lake anywhere. Um, today, we're going to talk about what it means um, as far as having a data lake in AWS, but, and then also the cases for our data lakes. But it's, good, it's important to understand data lakes are not bound to any specific, a specific location or tool or anything like that. But what we are gonna talk about is why AWS specifically um, is a great place for cloud-based data lakes and the case for those is, is, as well. And so when you talk about having a data lake in the cloud, specifically AWS, you have infinite scalability. You have infinite scalability, you have a ton of ways to uh, apply transformations to the data, which we'll get, get to in a second. You have a ton of tools that AWS provides you to um, run artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms. Uh, on that data, you have a ton of different API resources that you can use to query the data, um, and the list goes on and on. And so uh, when you have a cloud-based data lake, such as uh, data lake hosted in AWS, you have so much more versatility to get the most out of your data lake as possible. And we're going to go into what it looks like from beginning to end of a data lake. We're going to get some uh, pretty technical uh, in just a few moments here. Um, but it's important to understand, right, that every data lake architecture is different. And um, it's important to understand that cloud-based data lakes, such as AWS, really empower you to uh, take advantage and leverage all of the new uh, and improved and uh, available solutions that are out there to be able to manipulate and analyze your data really, really efficiently. 
Okay, so now let's get into what a data lake is and what makes up a data lake. So every data lake starts with a source. Every single um, data, uh, data origination or data lake, there has to be data coming in from somewhere. And so uh, it, it, a source of data can be any application or system that actually produces data. So a lot of times um, data can come from a third party database. It can come from incoming files or PDF, uh, uh, PDF objects. It can come from um, an IoT device that's out in the field. Every cell phone that's out there, every smartphone is an IoT device. And the data that you are inputting or the data that you're using, right, is going to some, uh, some source. And a lot of times companies have third party data sources such as Salesforce or uh, other CRM tools that they are getting data from. Data from. So the, the entry point of any data is, uh, it starts with a source. And that source can be ingestion in a number of ways. Um, the source can be uh, um, via an API. It can be via um, a, a OLTP or a JDBC uh, from a database. Um, it could be, like I said, it could be like a file transfer, an FTP, or it just could be right through a, a regular old-fashioned um, regular old-fashioned manual upload, right? So it doesn't really matter. The thing that's important as far as the data lake is concerned in order to automate it is to have an automated push or pull source to get that data, however it is, into the data lake, okay? So for example, let's say I have uh, IoT devices out in the field. Let's say I am, and I'm gonna keep coming back to this uh, example um, because I think it's a good example. Let's say I am a uh, manufacturer and I have IoT devices, which are just devices that are connected to the internet out in the field that are giving feedback on the status of the device so I can have predictive maintenance on there. So if it starts to be underperformant, that IoT device would recognize that and then send data back to the cloud so I can analyze that data more efficiently. And so I have the IoT uh, device connected to the internet. That data that that's, it, that that's gathering needs to either be pushed or pulled to that central data lake repository in AWS. And so there's a number of ways to do that. If we're pushing the data lake into AWS, we can install things like Amazon Kinesis, which is a data streaming tool um, into the IoT device. We can use uh, data, data Sync, which is another um, data push or pull tool. Or if we're specifically polling, we could use a, a, a Lambda function, which is a serverless compute resource to go out and um, specifically get certain data, either uh, continuously or in batches, to be able to go out and get that data and bring it into the cloud, into our central repository as raw data so that we can have um, different uh, different steps and transformations after that. So we have the data source, important to remember, you have your data source. In this case, it's the, uh, in my example, it's the IoT source, and you have mechanisms to go out and get the data or for the IoT source or data source in general to push the data to AWS. And remember, it's a central repository. So all the data that's coming in is raw, okay? It could be JSON files, could be CSV files, could be PDFs, could be database tables, it's coming in raw into a central data repository. And really, let's talk about what that means. This is where I like to say it's the heart of the lake or the deepest end of the lake, right? Um, all of that data that's coming in via push or pull from your, uh, from your source data location is going into Amazon S3. That's where the data is coming into. And usually it's a, it's a bucket or series of buckets you can think of as a as a repository of this data to exist in. And so as this data is coming in, it's coming in raw, right? It's coming in, like I said, as, as JSON files, maybe there's some CSV files, whatever it may be, it's coming into a central repository. And now that it's into the data lake, and this is the heart of the data lake, it's inside your uh, central repository, now is where we can get creative. So depending on what our data output should look like, this is where um, this is where we apply our manipulation tactics to it. So once the data is in a central repository, or we can call it a raw S3 bucket, we can apply transformations to that data as we move it along the process of being able to uh, be easily queryable or easily loaded into uh, a data warehouse or another database, which we'll get into here in a second. What are transformations? Transformations um, are, like I said, any ways to manipulate the raw data into what we're trying to achieve down the line via whatever analytics you're trying to see or whatever searches you're trying to be able to empower your users or 
um, internal employees to be able to get data. Transformations can include standardizing and format. So for example, if you have JSON and CSV, maybe you want to standardize those. You do you apply some transformations to, to standardize and format. You could be joining tables or joining data. You could be cr uh, creating an error table. Um, you could be um, standardizing in uh, columns and or rows. There are all types of things um, that you can do in the transformations. There are literally limitless amount of things you can do in transformations. And the transformations are happening as you move from raw bucket to transform bucket or transform bucket to consumable bucket, right? There's different steps in your data lake. This is why I said every data lake architecture is a little bit different. So there's different steps um, in a data lake depending on what your, what your expected output would be. And so you apply these transformations as you move the data from point A to point B to point C to point D. And that's done through a series of tools within AWS. This is why AWS is so important uh, when, you are, when you're building a data lake. A lot of customers like to automate this process as much as possible. And so they have serverless Lambda functions that are triggered every time new data hits the raw bucket. So data comes in from the data source, hits the raw bucket. S3 has an event notification, triggers a Lambda function to run its script, your transformation script, let's say it's a formatting script, to transform that data and then dump it into a transform bucket where your data is a lot more uh, consumable. And that process will run for as long as you need it to run, as many buckets as you need, however you need to have your data. Sometimes data is uh, segregated based on customer ID number. Sometimes uh, data is segregated based on um, infrastructure of the company versus um, you know different market segments and say so you have a marketing team or an HR team and the data needs to kind of break its way apart copies the data need to be made all types of flexible stuff that you can do with this data and this is why a data lake is so important because it empowers you to be able to manipulate your data in many many different ways okay what I said earlier as far as getting the data ready to be um, put into a pipeline or into another database or perhaps even into a data warehouse. This is where that happens. So I'm sure as you've been in the IT industry or if you're uh, a, a database engineer or a system admin, you've heard the term ETL. Uh, ETL means extract, transform, and load. And so oftentimes when we talk about ETL within a data lake, it's happening after that data is a little bit transformed in S3 and now we're loading it into either um, a database or um, a data warehouse, okay? So for, for example, I have my IoT devices out in the field, just like I said, they do predictive maintenance. I'm getting those that data into my central data lake repository. They're coming in as JSON files. I need to do some formatting and some other transformations to that data. I get it to a transformed or consumable bucket. Now from here, I need to replace this in a database so I can have fast predictive analytics down the line, okay? And so this is where I'd use an ETL tool to take that transformed and prepped data that I did in the data lake and quickly load it into a database or a data warehouse so I can do uh, high powered analytics and, and predictive maintenance, like I said earlier. Now, how you would do that is by using an ETL tool. AWS is great at offering ETL tools. Uh, one of the most popular ETL tools are, uh, is M uh, AWS Glue. What this does is it sends crawlers into your S3 bucket. Think of crawlers as just how they, just how they sound, uh, tools that go out and capture the data in S3, and they build tables based on uh, artificial intelligence and how it should be, and they load that into a database or a data warehouse. Okay, It's very automated. It's very easy to use. Um, and it's, it empowers a data cataloging methodology. Another tool that AWS offers is EMR, Elastic MapReduce. Uh, Elastic MapReduce applies a Hadoop framework to be able to process data very quickly and very, uh, very efficiently into a database or a data warehouse. And there's all types of functions and or scripts that you can implement into Elastic MapReduce um, in order to load your data into AWS. This along with AWS data pipeline would be for high volumes of data, data that you need real time analytics on, data that's constantly uh, coming and going in your AWS account. You're gonna see enterprise, enterprise customers use Amazon EMR, uh, that Hadoop framework. Sometimes they use Apache Spark within that EMR cluster. 
Other times they use some other tools within that EMR cluster, but this is for high, high amounts of data. Data pipeline, same thing, essentially. Data pipeline is, just how it sounds, a pipeline from the S3 bucket to uh, a data warehouse. There's a number of transformations that you can include in data pipeline. That's not as popular as, as you'll see as AWS Glue and uh, Amazon EMR being used. So when you hear Glue or hear EMR, uh, think ETL. When you, think, when you hear ETL, think uh, Glue or EMR. All right. So after the data is um, extracted, transformed, and loaded into a data warehouse or a database, now we can have high-powered uh, visualizations and analytics. So let's go back to um, my example. I have my IoT devices in the field, my predictive maintenance uh, IoT devices. They're on my machines. I get that data coming into S3. I need to do some formatting. I get it into a consumable bucket. From there, maybe I just query the bucket. Maybe I have an API in front of that consumable bucket and I go out and get files based on a search. That's what a lot of consumable buckets are for. But I need to go one step further. I need to get it into a data warehouse so I can have analytics. Now, I'll use things like Amazon Glue or AWS Glue, I should say, uh, to crawl through that consumable bucket and put it into a data warehouse. A data warehouse is similar to a database, but it's made for high powered analytics. A database is inventory, data warehouse is analytics, the way I like to think of it. Amazon Redshift is an awesome data warehouse within AWS that's infinitely scalable and very, very high powered. Now, once the IoT device data, those uh, JSON files are loaded um, into Amazon Redshift uh, as, as um, now as ta uh, tables within Redshift, I can have something like Amazon QuickSight, which is a visualization tool, be able to visualize the data that sits in Redshift and forecast what I'm going to see in the next um, six to eight months when I think I need to do uh, maintenance on those. Um, and uh, as long as a, a plethora of other tools in AWS that I can attach to this to do predictive maintenance, which we'll talk about in a separate, uh, a separate webinar. But now I can have a visualization, as you see on the right here, to uh, look at time series, uh, a, a time series data of my machines out in the field or do any forecasting or create any tables, pie charts, graphs, um, line charts, so on and so forth. Uh, endless amount of dashboards that you can create in Amazon QuickSight to be able to see exactly what's going on with your data. It's very important to understand that data tells a story, but in order for it to tell a story, you have to empower it to be capable to give you actionable insights. And all these steps together whether you're consuming data or you're um, querying it with a, a, a SQL API or you're visualizing it in a warehouse, you have to know the business case of what you're trying to do with the data and then apply the technology later. It's never technology than business. It's always business than technology. And so once you have the business case of understanding um, what you want to do with your data, now you can apply the technology in order to get you there. And that's where someone like ClearScale um, could come and apply the technology after you understand the business case. Um, let's look at the, the whole data lake altogether from what I talked about. This is the entire picture of a data lake. You can think of this as lake formation as well, which we'll get into in a second here. There's many different terms uh, and terminal terminologies of it. You can also think of it as a lake house, um, all types of stuff. But essentially, um, if you work left to right here, right? You have your, your data source. In my example, it was an IoT device. The IoT device moved the files into the raw data lake storage. And the way that it did that, for me at least, was uh, through Kinesis. It was pushing those uh, files via Amazon Kinesis, which is a data streaming service within AWS. Side note, this is why AWS is so great, because it offers all these tools for you to use. Um, so it pushes the data through uh, Amazon Kinesis into the, the data lake storage. Then from raw, curated, and consumables, when I'm running my transformations, to be able to empower um, the next phase of my data journey. Now, you might have remembered me saying earlier in the webinar that you could query the consumable bucket through an API. That can happen anytime. You can build a, a UI or um, use S3 UI to be able to query certain files that are transformed and easy, easily, uh, easy to read uh, right there in the consumable bucket. A lot of times customers don't even need a database. They just leave their data in that consumable organized bucket and their application uses it from there. Just depends on what you need. From the consumable bucket, you would use an ETL tool, such as Glue EMR, 
uh, a Lambda function is good too, or a data pipeline, as we discussed, to extract the data, um, catalog it, build indexes, and put that data into um, a data warehouse, such as Amazon Redshift, or a database, such as Aurora Postgres or Aurora MySQL. A third-party data warehouse that you might hear or have heard of already is Snowflake. It's an excellent solution, and you can put your data in Snowflake as well. From there, you can have your applications do SQL queries on the Amazon Redshift data warehouse. The data warehouse is made for querying. It's made for analytics. Or if you'd like, you can have Amazon QuickSight um, dashboarding for that data that's sitting in Redshift. Or you can even use QuickSight dashboarding for the data that's sitting in your consumable S3 bucket. Now you can get creative with this stuff, okay? Because some customers uh, like to explore with Amazon QuickSight, you may have heard of Tableau or Power BI. This is absolutely doable as well within AWS um, to be able to view these, uh, these analytics and data queries. So this is the, the altogether modern data lake within AWS. When people talk about data lakes, I hope uh, now that you have a good understanding from a technical standpoint, at least from a high level of what that means, and hopefully you can now see that this can scale and scale and scale and scale. There's a reason why companies like Netflix have this architecture um, inside uh, of their AWS environment so that they can predict and recommend new shows for you to watch, okay? The data source in that particular case is your living room. That's where the data source is. You're, you're watching things and um, you're pushing things to Netflix's AWS cloud and they're running analytics from there. So there's some challenges with building a data lake, as you can imagine, right? Um, you have to have a, an understanding of um, certain tools uh, that you can leverage. Um, you have to have, usually you have to have a, a diverse sources uh, of data flows and you have to have a good amount of data coming in, but not always. You have to understand what transformations you need, and you have to write those transformations in Python or Node.js or um, R, depends on wh however you want to write those. And that can be time consuming as well. And it can be, um, if you don't do it right, it can be costly. Um, so you want to make sure that you're having cost efficiency when building the data lake. This is where ClearScale comes in. Uh, and ClearScale has done this many, many times with many, many different customers uh, building data lakes for them because uh, we know exactly how data lakes should fit within environments. And once we have a good understanding of your business, um, we can uh, architect, design, and implement a data lake, usually from an MVP level, that you can grow and scale with. Now, it's very important to understand before I get into these case studies is that as a premier AWS partner, yes, we can build data lakes all day long. But we want our customers to be self-sufficient and educated in growing their data lake. Because at the end of the day, it's the customer's solution. It's not clear scales, meaning the customer is going to own the data lake in their AWS account. And so the customer needs to be able to, to understand how to manage the data lake and also how to grow the data lake with efficiency and cost optimization. And so we want to empower our customers to do that by usually providing a minimum viable product and teaching them how to grow and scale this thing. USA Baseball, let's talk about that one for, for just a quick second. So USA Baseball is an interesting, um, interest, uh, interesting use case. And essentially what was going on there is they, um, I should probably explain what USA Baseball is. They're, uh, uh, they're for amateur baseball. And basically what it does is partners with the MLB and overseeing more than 15 million players uh, across the United States. And they needed a better system for managing and sharing data collected through its joint um, initiative with MLB. So they were having all of these uh, data players all over the place. They had uh, player assessments, various metrics about athletes using sensors and 40 times and observations and manual um, write-ups and all types of stuff. A lot of this data was CSVs and PDFs. And so they were coming into, um, to coming into USA Baseball's database, and there was just no way for it to continue to grow and scale. Um, it was very inconsistent data. They wanted uh, the MLB and its partners to be able to find more relevant information faster. And so ClearScale consolidated uh, all this data into a data lake um, for querying. Uh, and in this case, we made an API uh, for SQL querying. Um, for their partners in MLB to find relevant information really, really quickly. 
Um, the tool that we used for this was Amazon Athena. If you want to go ahead and uh, look up Amazon Athena, it is a SQL query tool that is meant to query S3 um, through a SQL API. So uh, just like how you would query a database, you would query S3. And this is a really good use case as saying a data lake, you can stop at the consumable S3 bucket and use your S3 bucket as if it is a database. Imagine the cost savings there because you're prepping the data and putting it in an environment that's really, really cost efficient. Um, you are now saving a ton of money uh, instead of having to pay for a database. So this is what was uh, enabled for um, USA Baseball and um, it turned out to be a really good output. So uh, feel free to watch the video um, when you have a chance and you will uh, hear directly from them. Uh, C4ADS, uh, the Center for uh, Advanced Defense Studies. So uh, this is a nonprofit organization uh, that's in Washington, D.C., and is, uh, its main goal is to provide data-driven analytics and evidence-based reporting on global con conflict and transnational security issues. Okay, pretty important stuff. At least it sounds pretty important. <laughs> they needed a solution that uh, included evidence-based and data-driven analytics concerning global conflict um, for their partners, okay? And so they needed to determine uh, certain patterns of what they've seen in the past they needed to forecast what they might see in the future, and they needed uh, high-powered analytics um, and searching capabilities for all the data that was coming in. The data that was coming in was a plethora of data formats. It was PDFs. It was emails. It was Microsoft Word, Excel files, application logs, XML, JSON files, literally almost every file that you can think of. And think about emails coming in for a second. Think about how dirty emails are as far as data structure. Um, hopefully not the content, more as far as data structure, right? You have signatures, you have um, disclaimers, you have pictures in your signature. It, it can be uh, very, very messy, forwarding headers, so on and so forth. So imagine trying to search through that stuff. It's kind of a nightmare. Um, ClearScale was able to implement a data lake for transforming and enriching, uh, enriching is another word for combining, combining data, scrubbing data, getting rid of useless information as it rolled through the data lake process from bucket to bucket and um, was able to ex uh, extract the metadata and put that into uh, a serverless database called DynamoDB, uh, which is a NoSQL database, key value store, and the rest of the data in Elasticsearch, um, which is now Amazon OpenSearch, um, which is AWS's managed service for Elasticsearch. Um, for querying that was required. And along with that, ClearScale also made a user interface for users to query um, Amazon OpenSearch very, very easily. And so they had all this data that was coming in that had to be formatted correctly. It had to be joined correctly. It had to be scrubbed. It had to have um, change data capturing and error tables. And it needed to go through mul this multiple step process, needed to have correct metadata, the metadata needed to go into a NoSQL database. The data itself needed to go into a, uh, an open search database. And then it had to have a user interface in order to query that open search database. And ClearScale implemented all that, all that from an MVP level, empowered C4 ADS to grow that within Amazon um, and, and manage that as well. And so that made, uh, made it very easy um, for them to do evidence-based reporting, um, uh, future pattern recognition. Uh, they uh, ended up in um, implementing some AI tools after it was in Elasticsearch to be able to, um, you know, get more use and more uh, executable, actionable insights from their data. Okay, now their data is telling a story as opposed to just getting a crap load of data and, and not really knowing what to do with it. Smug mug. <laughs> SmugMug is uh, an all-in-one photography sharing and hosting service that enables users to store, protect, share, and sell their photos on a single platform. Um, the interesting thing about uh, SmugMug here is that they acquired another company, Flickr, and Flickr had uh, transactional work workloads loaded uh, into Aurora, Amazon Aurora, uh, as OLTP. So Flickr had all these transactional workloads um, and after SmugMug acquired them, they said, hey, we already have an Aurora database. Let's just put all this in our Aurora database and use it as OLTP, uh, online uh, transactioning, uh, transactional protocol. And so 
um, that was a problem because Aurora is not really meant for uh, OLTP and it couldn't couldn't scale. So they, they uh, yes, they uh, Smug Monk leveraged uh, read replicas within Aurora, which is just copies of the database mentally made for 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 application reads. But it couldn't substitute, you know, it didn't offer the fully featured o, uh, OLTP, and it cannot handle the terabytes that Flick, uh, Flickr had gathered and soon to continue to gather. And so they need to extrapolate this data. They need to put it in a central repository. You can you can start hearing how data lakes uh, have a pattern to them. They need a central repository, and they need to manipulate the data based on the different use cases for that data. And so uh, ClearScale built the central repository data lake implemented a Redshift um, data warehouse, uh, implemented step functions, uh, which are Lambda functions, to be able to do those transformations um, in a uh, time timely-based manner, which is why step functions uh, exist. They're just basically Lambda functions that run on a, a schedule and run in steps as a state uh, state machine. Um, and, uh, and it really enabled SmugMug to uh, have more performance, scalable OLTP solution through Redshift um, and analytics for such activities. So. Uh, it, it broke apart, loosely coupled that data, uh, had different destinations for different data uses, usage, and eventually um, had more performing applications. Um, you know, addressing the trend for uh, with AWS lake formation. So lake formation, uh, think of it, like I said, there's data lakes, there's lake formation, lake house, right? We're all really kind of talking about the same thing, to be completely honest with you. Lake formation is a, a, a tool within AWS that um, it, it helps accommodate uh, your your start of the, of the data lake process, right? Um, and so when we talk about uh, data lakes, it's okay to think about lake formation or lake houses because essentially um, what we're talking about is the automation creation of a data lake. So this is where it gets uh, super interesting. Um, ClearScale, like I said, um, ClearScale is fantastic at building data lakes for our customers. Um, we, do, we do this very, very often. Uh, and we empower customers, most importantly, we empower customers to be able to manage the data lakes themselves moving forward and understand what's in their environment, how to build, how to innovate, and um, how to operationally uh, manage their data lakes. And so uh, our offering is a six-week engagement um, that we talk, about the, uh, we talk about the business use cases, the roadmap, um, for the end state architecture. We uh, take a look at the data, the data sources, um, the, the analytics that you want to get out of this or the, 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 the um, searchable queries that you want to get out of this, so on and so forth. Then we deploy the data lake usually via infrastructure as code. Infrastructure as code is something that we like to do here at ClearScale. It empowers um, automated way of provisioning your AWS resources um, and you're treating your AWS resources as if it is application code. Now, there, uh, I would definitely get into this in a separate webinar, but um, when you hear infrastructure as code, just think of provisioning and launching AWS resources in a way that's automated. We'll go ahead and, and provision the infrastructure as code for your data lake. We'll get to the basic components, the ingestion, the source uh, S3 repository, um, and uh, the ETL and the data, uh, data warehouse set up for you guys. Um, we'll provide a minimum amount of uh, tra transformations, um, such as data joining or format changes, and uh, some sample dashboards and sample queries so that you can see how, uh, how you can visualize your data and how to build this more uh, in the future. And so obviously, at the end of the engagement, we want to provide our customers with recommendations on what to do next, but also run books on how to, on how to incorporate more data sources or how to incorporate more transformations. Or let's say they want to have an API down the road to be able to query the consumable S3 bucket. We will provide best practices and documentation on how to do that so our customers are not left hanging uh, when trying to grow and scale their data lake. That's what ClearScale is about with their data lake setup. And that's what we offer to our customers. And it's been extremely, extremely successful thus far. So just as uh, wrapping up here, um, again, you know, thank you for the time. Data lakes are, are something that you're going to find that every single, every single business out there eventually at one point or another is going to have some form of data lake because everything runs on data now. And so don't be left behind and, do, and have to do all this retrospective um, retrofitting, you know, type of adjustments when you have a, 
a large amount of data. Get it, get the foundation in place right now. Get uh, the infrastructure set up within AWS. Use ClearScale to help architect and design for the future and stay on top of your data path because eventually the data is going to be there if it's not there already and you're going to have to have a, uh, executable, actionable insights. And so reach out to ClearScale, reach out to your account executive um, to be able to start that conversation. And um, we look forward to working with you uh, very, very soon. Thank you so much.